So I'm going to uh, uh, introduce Mr. Bill Kish. He was uh, not available last year. Bill is the uh, one of the two co-founders of Ruckus, and uh, I love you. I didn't, I, you guys aren't live or anything, so I didn't say that publicly. But uh, so this is Bill Kish, and uh, we're going to ask him some questions. Yeah, and I think it's probably good just Bill because you weren't a part of some of the other conversations. We did a lab tour, and we've talked a little bit about you know all of this software that we redesigned. You know, at the in terms of enhancing the reference design. Mm -hmm. We've talked a little bit about antennas and you know, RF performance, but I, th I think we would be wise to talk a little bit about software you know, and, and maybe even some of the work that you've done specifically about how, how software needs to be smarter to, to control good hardware. Sure. So the key challenge with Wi-Fi is that we're operating in this sort of this crazy unlicensed spectrum. It's, um, it's unlike really uh, anything uh, wireless protocols have had to deal with before. Sorry, sir. I think your mic got muted. Can you click, it Can you click that switch on the top? Did that do it? Much better. OK. So, so Wi-Fi has to deal with this crazy unlicensed spectrum. And the, the sort of the, the variance and the dynamics that you get with this unlicensed spectrum is, is actually pretty crazy. Uh, one of the hardest things with Wi-Fi is actually uh, testing it across this, this wide range of, of conditions. And the reason this is a problem is you can make an algorithm that works in a particular type of environment. Let's say you're trying to make a, a physical layer data rate selection algorithm. Um, and you, you, you test this algorithm in the limited environments you have available to you, but then you unleash it on the world. And in the, in the real world, the spectrum varies tremendously from location to location and from time to time. And you can have an algorithm that works really well in a particular environment, but totally falls over a significant percentage of time in the real world. And that's one of the real challenges. So you need really smart algorithms that can adapt to these crazy changing conditions you get in the real world and can um, be stable. And by stable, I mean uh, do the right thing from the standpoint of uh, having a positive impact on the user performance. And it turns out that that's, that's kind of a non-trivial thing to do because um, you know, how do you test all the Wi-Fi corner cases, all the corner cases of how Wi-Fi systems can overlap, how different interference can come and go? Um, it's, it's a highly chaotic uh, sort of unmodelable problem. So you need, you need algorithms that, that don't get fooled into all these corner cases. Wi-Fi is really kind of like all corner cases when you get out in the real world. So you need metrics that are very stable under these changing, uh, unpredictable conditions. And it turns out, really, one of the only metrics that is stable uh, under these conditions that you can use as a basis for optimizing is throughput. And so that's something that we've used as the basis for all of our uh, adaptation models. Um, so a real key part of our software is uh, adapting the degrees of freedom that the chipsets provide for us and adding additional degrees of freedom on top of that. What wireless really needs is lots of degrees of freedom. You're trying to get energy from point A to point B. And the more options you have for getting that energy from point A to point B, the more li likely you are to have reliable communication. Uh, the phi rates are, are one manifestation of that. Uh, antenna dimensions that we add on top of the phi rates are additional degrees of freedom that we bring to the table that uh, is fairly unique to ruckus. The, uh, the key thing here, it's kind of, you can kind of think of it like in terms of disk redundancy. If, you, if a single disk isn't redundant, you can add multiple disks to have a system that is, is now uh, more, uh, more redundant. You've added degrees of freedom, freedom by making sort of redundant disks. Having uh, more options for getting the energy from point A to point B is kind of the wireless analogy of that. You want as many degrees of freedom as possible. So that's really what uh, we're trying to do is harness all the degrees of freedom that are naturally available from the chipset, and then add additional degrees of freedom on top of that to make a wireless system as, as reliable as possible. It turns out antennas are a major uh, way of doing that. But now you have this huge algorithmic problem of adapting all these degrees of freedom to these crazy changing conditions in real time. And that's one of the things that we've sort of uh, mastered here with uh, throughput-based metrics. How do you, well, maybe let them ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. To get that throughput metric, mm -hmm. it takes time, mm -hmm. which means you can't be being an AP while you're doing it. Well, or, or how do you how do you solve that problem? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, we use algorithms that are um, related to machine learning to do that in real time. It's sort of an um, online machine learning type algorithm where for every transmission, we are gathering data and feedback. And we feed that into a model that we use to optimize throughput uh, essentially in real time. So we're not actually sending additional traffic. It's only the, the actual traffic that we are normally using that uh, is the basis for all of our optimizations and throughput modeling. That works really good if you're sitting on a channel. <coughs> Doesn't channel fly have to go someplace else to find out what the, what's available on the channel that I'm not currently on? Uh, yes, channel fly uh, uh, generates those throughput estimates while it's actually using a channel. So it actually ch will change to a channel and use that channel. But if I'm, if I'm a client, on channel one, and my channel fly feeds over on channel two, I'm not being able to be a client for a little while. No, so we use the, uh, the 11H channel change notification to move all the clients with us when we, uh, when we change a channel. So I should say the, the, the channel change notification that was originally introduced in 11H, because it's actually part of the, the normal 8.0 to 11 uh, standard right now. Do, do you have any list of how many M clients support the channel switch announcement so they can follow. <laughs> yeah, so it turns out that all the, uh, all the Broadcom and Theros clients support it. Because of the DFS. Uh, yeah, so we've seen basically all the smartphones, all the Apple products, uh, all the smartphones at least that have, uh, all the high-end ones that have Broadcom chips uh, support it. So that's, that's the good news. And that's really the most challenging environments. The most challenging environments in this day is when, you know, uh, you know, thousands of people show up with thousands of smartphones. Those are the, so that's the frontier of Wi-Fi right now. Those are the hardest environments, and we're lucky that in those environments, uh, pretty much all the clients support it. Well, most clients don't support 5 gigahertz on the phone, right? Uh, that's true, um, except they still support the channel change notification, it turns out. Uh, the channel change, it was originally introduced as part of 11H, but it's part of the normal 811 standard now. And so uh, pretty much all the Broadcom and Theros clients support regardless of the band that they're in. So how do you deal with the, when you're doing the channel fly, you obviously do not hop the channels and scan for them, right? So it's initial 15 or what minutes for the algorithm to tune in, and then it's predictably looking for the better deal, right? Yes, so, so it uses, um, it, it learns over time. So it does take some time for it to learn. And, and during that interval, uh, you know, it, it, it switches more often. But it basically, you, if, you, if you look at sort of as a function of time, um, if this is time, and if this is your sort of your, your rate of channel change, it, it goes down like this. Where this is something like, one to four hours sort of, uh, sort of level. Um, and how, that's, that's like the learning period. Mm -hmm. If there was an environmental change, a neighbor throws up a new AP, mm -hmm. does it take that long to cycle the second time? Uh, no, after this, it, it's sort of, um, it's sort of dampened in. I mean, it'll, it'll it evolve much more slowly after this initial period. The, the, the new one will change rapidly to sort of try to elbow its way in somewhere. Um, but uh, the, the existing ones will change much more slowly after that. How do you, oh, sorry, how do you take, it, this is great if I have, I'm protecting myself from neighbors. How do you protect yourself against other ruckus APs on Channel Fly who are moving at the same time? Or do they coordinate all this back at, at the controller? No, it, so it's not coordinated. It actually uses a, uh, a distributed optimization technique uh, based on uh, op uh, so it's, it's based on an optimization technique known as simulated annealing, uh, where it's actually distributed and doesn't actually require coordination. And so they, they don't chase each other around? They don't, they do, it, well, so, so I'll, I'll go to an a analogy of, um, so simulated annealing, is this, it's, it's a well-known optimization technique that's been used in lots of things like circuit design. I'm not aware of anyone that's applied it to sort of wireless networks up to now. Uh, but the basic idea of annealing, it's like, uh, it, it's, a, it's an, a reference to the physical process of annealing metal, where you take some metal and you heat it up. And the goal is to make the metal strong, or i.e. in a low energy state. Um, so you heat it up and then you cool it slowly. 
And that allows the, the domains, uh, the magnetic domains of the atoms to arrange themselves in sort of a low energy state, sort of crystallize, if you will, uh, in a way. Uh, this process doesn't require any coordination. It's just the, the, the fact that the atoms interact with each other with decreasing probability over time that allows them to crystallize into a structure that's uh, a low energy state. And so that's effectively what we're, we're going after here. We're trying to allow the APs to interact initially um, more vigorously with their neighboring APs and sort of find their way into their low energy niche and over time allow them, uh, make it much more difficult for them to escape that, that sort of niche that they've gotten themselves into. So can I rephrase that? It's kind of ugly for a little while? Uh, it's, well, it, it's not in a strong, it's not in a low energy state, right? It's, it's, it's like, just like if you had a piece of metal that you heated up, uh, when you heat it up, it's not strong yet. And it's this process of cooling it down that makes it strong or that gives you the capacity. Yeah. So one of the things, that we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, so what I wanted to do is, this is Q&A like you do with Bill, but I also wanted to bring Victor in as well. So Victor, you are, can go to the front as well. <laughs> So, so again, this is just a this is a firing line. I know Marcus has some questions that he wanted to maybe say on to, to there are some points that you guys have told us before. Um, so, so there you are. There's the guys. Um, I, I have a question about let's say we can find more cable arena mm -hmm. as an example. Obviously, you want to have as much capacity as possible using more channels, so the the, the spectrum the spectral capacity as its highest. Mm -hmm. How do you deal that then with road devices like MiFi or what, what, whatever being introduced by the visitors mm -hmm. because when you're using this you do not hop other channels and search for it like for the Y WIPs, the, uh, WIPs device so you cannot if you have a support team for example Cisco did it on Wembley Stadium they just said oh that reporter that whatever brought in uh, uh, a MiFi it's eating up our, our overall capacity. It's there because we can triangulate them. So they just went out and removed it proactive, uh, actively mm -hmm. because the events you have are limited in time period and you want it to be as, as good as possible. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle that? So for example, you have 20 MiFi devices introduced in a one uh, sector mm -hmm. that is eating up your bandwidth. Um, I mean, there's, there's not much magic. I mean, you can remove them. Um, I mean, if you really wanted to solve this problem uh, and you had unlimited budget, what you would do is you'd put this uh, huge array of antennas all around the stadium and have this centralized sort of uh, brain that generated preamble beams to each one of these individually and blocked them effectively. <laughs> Uh, it would take a lot of antennas because to generate those precise beams, you'd need literally uh, probably a thousand antennas generated and nothing to do here except blocking the, the MIFIs. It's, it's you know, technically possible to do it probably. But uh, beyond that, I'm not sure that there's... Um, uh, so, 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 there's what Cisco does, which is the laser thing, right? Where they shoot the thing with the laser. If you guys saw the video, <laughs> you, we, we're putting lasers on the thing and we're going to just zap it with that. The thing is, sharks works. Sharks lasers. lasers. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, this works, for example, if you have it's set up on a venue that is constant, so it's 24-7 or, you know, I don't know, Disney World, it's, it's there. But you have a venue that is for the critical for you to have really good performance, mm -hmm. then you usually have the support team. So if you have the support team with functionality, it would be great because they could triangulate the devices and just go there and say, could you please turn it off? Mm -hmm. For example, like the peanuts. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what? For example, Apple, Apple Keynotes. Yeah, yeah Apple. Yeah. yeah, Apple Keynote. Oh. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Is that? The Keynote, you know, the, the Steve Jobs. Jobs yeah. you use oh, it, oh, okay. You, you use right. it in your demo video. Hmm. You cannot handle that. Well, what is the transmit power of these MiFi anyway these days? Aren't they fairly low? It should be anywhere between like 30 to, it depends on who But the radio it. sensitivity is so high on. I guess in Ruckus in particular, but any, any enterprise AP that even at the lowest transmit powers. But the other thing is, if you have a crowd of 20,000 and you add people, you know, bring in some MiFi's, you know, it's just like down to New York City. If, if all of us go down to New York City, we're not changing anything. There's not enough of us to make a change. You know, so, so you know, the, the phones are just as much of a problem. Um, 
but as you add some of these devices, they, they don't hurt as much as other devices do. By the way, how, how did DMC work out? Actually worked, so actually worked pretty well. Throughput? Yeah, um, I think we, we, we saw something, what, 6,000 It was a lot. I don't know, is it, is it, I don't know how proprietary or unproprietary yeah. that data is, unfortunately. You can tell. Yeah. Many, many thousands. The other dudes crashed. We didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> both, both the uh, the, the, the Cisco the, data. the Cisco uh, network that the DNC brought in for their own operations, as well as the uh, AT and T the, the uh, DAS DAS network crashed, but the uh, the Rockets Wi Fi was working. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it was no, no, cellular, cellular DAS. Their own cellular, their cellular own DAS. DAS. <clears throat> it actually was great. It was actually a great success. There. Yeah, um, so it was a uh, it was sort of an interesting deployment. Uh, I mean, arenas are really the hardest um, the hardest thing to get right because everything's exposed to everything, and there's um, uh, you really can't hide the APs from each other. So you go you go into an empty arena, and you can put up one AP, and then you can go pretty much anywhere in the seating area and see that AP and, and connect to it uh, reasonably well. So uh, there's a lot of self interference. Uh, so we actually developed a new antenna for this uh, for this arena with a 30 degree uh, beam width, which would allow us to pack more. Uh, yeah, it's actually this one right here, which would allow us to pack uh, more APs in, uh, in a, at a higher level of density uh, and uh, increase the capacity that way. So yeah, we think it's a it's a pretty successful deployment. We're really looking forward to uh, more five gig devices uh, coming online. Of course, the uh, the iPhone 5 here uh, will have that. Uh, we think we think we can get about two gigs of capacity in the uh, in the actual arena bowl over five gigs, which will so be. So we're uh, using then uh, you install the APs on the top, shooting uh, shooting down, or have you used? Uh, yeah. So the uh, the majority of the um, of the coverage is from the catwalk uh, facing down, yeah. uh, and then of course all the suite APs uh, covering the the suites themselves. Have you used any? Pico satellite deployment shooting below, upwards to the seats? Uh, yeah, we're playing with uh, some under the seat APs. Um, they work well when the arena is empty, but uh, the addition of the people kind of puts it over the limit for, uh, for being useful. Uh, yeah, at least it's very high density of APs. Mm -hmm. There's a question from the stream wondering, um, from Wi-Fi Day, what kind of 2.4 uh, to 5 uh, gigahertz client mixer are you seeing in these large deployments? The arena was actually quite unique that we saw uh, about 50 percent. Uh, really? It's five so that, that's, not, that's not typical. That's a bunch of people coming in for the convention, right, with right. laptops and stuff. Not like at a, at a if it was a, it was a lot of basketball game, game I doubt that would be the case, right? It was a lot, of, was a, a lot of tablets. It's Bobcat, so it's never full. <laughs> <laughs> well, Democrats like five games. <laughs> <laughs> I think if, if we can maybe switch topic back to RF a little bit. Um, we've had some of these conversations in the past, Bill, about um, looking ahead to 11AC and starting to think about things like more spatial streams, multi-user MIMO, and even some of the criticisms of, of Beamflex and saying, you know, is, is there as much of a need for Beamflex with, you know, with MIMO 11N, 11AC, does it make a bigger deal? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you can speak to some of those things. What does it take to get more spatial streams? Does Beamflex help? You know, in those cases. Yeah, it turns out um, the more antennas, the more radio change you put on the radio, the more you need adaptive antennas uh, to actually make full use of those spatial streams or those those uh, those multiple radio chains. Um, the environment doesn't naturally provide <coughs> you with these wonderful diverse paths. The environment gives you what it gives you. Um, and so any ability to influence the, the propagation of the signal uh, has the ability to maximize the use of the number of radio chains that the, uh, the radio has. So uh, unlike a lot of people expected a beamflex to become irrelevant with 11N, it actually became more important. And we actually saw the, the gains from, uh, from beamflex with 11N uh, surpass the gains that we saw with beamflex on 11G. Are you going to have to spend a lot more time on both your, your algorithms and design of your antennas with uh, AC to, to adapt it to that standard as well? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, we have anticipated it, and the, the, this current generation of antennas coming out already has sort of 
AC support, if you want to call it that, although uh, it's more, the antennas themselves are, of course, standard independent, right? They're frequency selective and all that stuff, but it's the interaction of the antennas that is what's kind of Bill's referring to. It's once you start having three chains, four chains, or however many chains, now they're, the, the, the interactions between them are in play, and how can you minimize that, or how can you optimize that interaction to give you the highest throughput. You, you want them to be maximally decorrelated, uh, and so there's lots of things you can do with them to make to start them out uh, more decorrelated than, than others. On the algorithm side, uh, the more degrees of freedom you give the system, the, the more demands it makes of the software. Uh, so that's definitely a challenge. Uh, we've developed algorithms that, at this point, uh, we believe are statistically optimal. So they can, uh, they'll be able to navigate the search space as efficiently as, as anything, uh, sort of within some statistical bound of optimality. I know with the um, with that at 211E, and in, in, in a lot of cases when we've been deploying it in, in the real world, that we found that in five gigahertz, often 20 megahertz channel widths make more sense for a client capacity mm -hmm. and throughput um, sort of metric than going to 40 megahertz. Absolutely. With the AC type environment having starting at 80 mm -hmm. gigahertz channels, would that affect that a lot? No, I mean I think. AC is mostly a consumer technology. Um, you know, the best thing about AC from my perspective is, it, is that it's five gigahertz only. I mean, if you really care about uh, uh, Wi-Fi and demanding environments, AC is not going to do anything to help you. AC increases the, the best case performance, but does nothing for the uh, what really matters, which is kind of the worst case performances. Well, it helps with IPv6. How so? Why? Because of the broadcasting and VLANs uh, issue right now. Uh, as uh, the key is implemented with N and legacy, the villains are broadcasted so everybody can see if it's IPv6, if you do not have any um, configuration on the router or uh, uh, stuff like this. So it's a bomb. How, how is a file going to help that? Because the key, the key, the AC key system is a bit different with AC than it was to N. Matthew Guess and uh, I think that Tom wrote a blog about this a while ago, so you can check this out. Well, I have another question. Just from an outdoor environment, do you have any antennas that are going to be able to handle three and four spaces for outdoor point to point? Yes, we have antennas now. Uh, do we have any of them here? For, um, um, we, we do have three and four now. Uh, now, there's only, you know, now you're talking about point to point, pure line of sight. Three and four spatial streams. Uh, not really happening. Uh, it's not. It's not antenna dependent. It's just the antennas have to be decorrelated. But for, a, but for access, you, for access, you'll definitely get three spatial streams working right. some percentage of the time. So you need. Okay, let me just to get three and four. So MIMO, as you know, 11N needs multipath. It just if if you take out the multipath component out of it and you have the same polarization, you're not going to get multiple streams out of it um, until you have multipath. So now by saying by saying point to point, now that almost by definition has no multipath. So now you have two degrees. You can do. Oh, we always have. We the dual pole is always there. That is the, the sort of uh, table stakes. If you don't have dual pole, and by the way, not a lot of people know how to make dual pole omnis. I mean that that that's what's kind of is is necessary uh, for that to dance. But you asked specifically to answer your specific question is for point to point. Now that means you have a you know, as near, quote unquote, as narrow beam as you possibly can, and they're looking at each other, and there's no multipath in the in the way. It's going to be hard to get more than two streams out of that, just because you get the, the two polarizations get you the two streams, and beyond that, you don't have that third dimension. They're talking about this third dimension, right? You've probably read the, in, on the news where they the with the the, the twisting the, the wave, but that the multipath basically breaks it. That sort of it's a nice it's a, it's a good research thing, but it's not here yet, and it may sort of never be here due to the distortions that are, that are um, in, in the atmosphere. Um, but anyway, long story, two we guarantee you, and actually we do a lot better two streams, right? You basically have to have two poles, basically. Um, but four streams, pure line of sight, that's going to be hard. And you can't throw power at it, right? You have to throw decorrelation at it. So the antennas have to look very, very different. That's the point. The point is, is I have to the, the point is, right, you understand the point is that I have to, t if I'm doing a two by two, then this antenna has to look different to this antenna than this antenna. And when I say look different, it's how does it look different? Oh, it has a different multipath profile. 
right? Right, it has a different set of these reflections that come, that come at it, right? So here's power and here's time, right? And you have, you know, here's the first guy, here's his reflection, you know, whatever, maybe here's another, you know. So if you have something like this, th this is, and this only exists between a pair, of, a, a, a pair of antennas, right? When you have another pair of antennas in the same environment, hopefully these things are slightly different so that you can tell them apart, okay? That's how, that's at the low level, that's how this, when you do this two by two business, right? So this and that. So let's say this is this and this is that. And that's how this antenna looks different to this antenna and this antenna looks different to this antenna. If you don't have that, you can do one stream. You can do you know, diversity schemes and everything else. So anyway, long story, but you've asked a very kind of difficult question to answer. And sometimes it just, at this point, now you're messing with laws of physics, Einstein stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Any one last question before we start lunch? Not a question, but a comment. Definitely layer one right there and layer two right there. <laughs> <laughs> I actually encompass multiple layers. <laughs> <laughs> All the way up to eight? Uh, yeah. <laughs>